Mr. Lee at this time. And I said Mr. Lee, none of you, Mr. none of you are Lee. Mr. Lee. Come on back here. You ready, Mr. Lee? Now everyone else can walk back with him. Everyone else, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. I think the weather's just got everybody wound up today. I can't blame them. It's wound me up. Actually, my wife says I wind them up when I get silly in announcement. She said you wind the kids up. It's your fault. So She's right. Matthew chapter 20. I'm just such a sinner. Been in the process of sanctification for a lot of years. You should have met me a while back. <laughs> That's all I can say. When I was uh, four years old, my brother was about two and a half, and I normally, I was the child out of our three siblings in our family. Well, Daniel up here. That's neat. I was the child in, in our family who feared consequences probably more than the eldest and the youngest. I was the middle kid. And I don't know if that's middle kid, but I was always the one that was afraid of being beaten to death or uh, you know, the things my siblings weren't afraid of. And uh, my brother was two at the time, and my mom says that I was acting up in Sunday school class and she was the teacher. That's hard having your mom be your Sunday school class teacher, by the way. I mean, you just can't get separation between what you did at Sunday school or what you did at home. It's just a, it's a real hardship for kids. Uh, but anyway, my mom said, Ryan, what's gotten into you? Why are you acting like this today? And I said, I don't know. I guess I just must be hanging around Daniel too much. And it's true. He's still around and been influencing me uh, for evil for a lot of years. And so uh, if you're wondering where my faults come from, it's my younger sibling. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. You folks that know my brother know it's true too, don't you? <laughs> okay. Verse 1 of Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I'll give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out, and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Okay, we'll read the rest of the text in just a little bit. I think most of you know it, know how it ends up, and we're going to pray and ask the Lord's help and try to make a couple of simple, insightful, a uh, uh, couple of insightful applications about God and about God's kingdom. Father, please help us with our understanding. Please help us with our focus. And Lord, on a practical level, I just pray that you would teach us from your word something that we could actually uh, just live. That this week as we are considering living for Jesus and as we're living our daily lives, that we could practically apply and we just pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story of the man, and you know, this never made as much sense to me growing up as it does today. I live on Oakland Park Boulevard, uh, just one street off of Oakland Park Boulevard, close by the Home Depot. And uh, every morning at the Home Depot near my house, when you go into the Home Depot from between 6 o'clock, uh, really beginning, yeah, beginning as early as 6 a.m. until about 9 a.m., there are a bunch of people standing on the curb with the area where you drive through the middle of the Home Depot parking lot. A bunch of guys congregate and stand there. And uh, what they're looking for is work. They're standing there, and uh, when you drive by, if you drive by in a pickup truck or a van, they always flag at you, wave, you're like, hey, you know, hire me. I want to work. And so growing up, I never saw anything like this in Kansas, but it happens every day by my house, and I can actually kind of envision this in my mind's eye. All these people that are out, and uh, they're working day jobs. They want to do day labor, and it, of course, is a lot smarter if you're going to do day labor uh, instead of using a labor agency that's going to make half of your paycheck to just go work for people yourself. That's a good way to find work. 
a lot of guys uh, that are looking for work, I tell them, hey man, there's work out there. I tell you, I've never had a trouble finding work to do. Now, I've maybe had trouble getting paid sometimes, but never had trouble finding work. And I always tell people, God made us to work, and if you'll go out and work, you'll get paid. That's the honest truth of the matter. Someone may take advantage of you, but if you're a good worker, someone will hire you, and uh, someone will even try to hire you away from the person who hired you. Work isn't hard to find, actually. It's easy uh, when you know how to do it. So I always, the guy said, well, how do you find a job? I said, well, go find people that are working and just start working there. And uh, if they ask you, who are you, say, I'm a worker. And uh, you want to hire me? And, uh, you know, I, I'm telling you, this honest truth, I'd walk onto a job site somewhere and just start working if I was looking, if I were looking for work. People want people that want to work. Well, as I look at this, as I look at this group of individuals here, there is a bit of a prejudice in me against the, 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 the late day guys. There's just something about a guy that'll get up and go to work at 5 or 6 a.m. that tells you he's serious about working, isn't there? And there's just something about a guy, you know, if he's up at 5 o'clock and says, I want to work, that convinces me he's serious about it, much more so than a guy who is up at the 11th hour of the day, literally in the afternoon. I haven't seen it. It may happen, but I haven't gone through Home Depot and seen guys at 3 p.m. standing on the curb trying to flank something and see if they can get some work for the day. Does that make sense? In other words, it actually doesn't make much sense for guys to not be working. Matter of fact, when you look in the text, at uh, the guys that are in the 11th hour, look at verse 6. About the 11th hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto him, them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Notice what they're found doing. Idling. Uh, Brother Lee made a clever statement the other day when we were working on the church parking lot. He said it to Luke. Remember this, Luke, about the idling? Uh, okay, tell us how it goes with the blower. If the blower's idle, then... If the blower is idling, then you shouldn't be. shouldn't be. So the other day we were working the parking lot. He was a leaf chaser. Anytime a leaf landed on the parking lot, he's supposed to keep it out of our asphalt sealer. And so it, anyway, the, the blower was sitting idling. And Lee said, Luke, is the blower idling? And Luke said, yes, it is. He said, if the blower is idling, then you shouldn't be. In other words, you need to be working. I thought that was clever. I'm going to use it on everybody from here on out. If it's idling, you shouldn't be. You know, an engine that's running is made to be doing something. Otherwise, it's a waste. And so when I see these guys in the marketplace, I really think of Luke and the blower, you know. I'm not really. <laughs> when I see these guys in the marketplace, I think these guys aren't serious about working. Right? If they were serious about working, if they really wanted work, when would they have been standing on the curb flagging people? First thing in the morning, right? I mean, when are the best jobs? First thing in the morning. When are you going to get the longest work day? First thing in the morning. There's a reason these guys are standing in the marketplace, and my judgmental self says it's because they're lazy and they don't want to work. How about you? Could I be right? Oh, you know what? They were up all night, you know, feeding the baby. You know, they, they could, the guy couldn't get up in the morning because he was up all night. Whatever. Any person who doesn't make himself disciplined enough to get up in the morning is just not going to, is not going to be very successful in the workforce. Isn't it true? Yeah. You learn personal discipline habits on a personal level, you'll be amazed at how much easier life is for you and how much more opportunity you have. There are so many people who say, well, I'm not going to work a job like that. You know, I, I, you know, I've got a college degree or I should. And the truth of the matter is, is that unless you're a good worker, it doesn't matter what you know, you're not worth anything. You can't produce anything. And so I'm here to say that if I'm going to hire someone on a permanent level, I'm going to hire the first hour guys. Right? Who are the best workers here? They're the guys in the first hour, right? Okay, who are the worst workers here? The last guys. That's common sense. And the Scripture isn't trying to contradict that at all. It's trying to show us something about God. Now look at, the, look at verse 8. The Bible says, So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire beginning from the last unto the first. Now, I want to go back to verse 2. 
The Bible says when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. What was the agreed wage? A penny a day. That's pretty good, even today, I think. I'm not, well, depends on what you yeah, anyway. <laughs> He agreed with them for a penny a day, and that was a, that was a fair day's wage. Fair enough that they said, okay. And they shook on it and went into the vineyard. They said, okay, good. Uh, it was early enough in the morning, factually, in the story, that if these guys didn't want to work for a penny a day, they could have said, I'll just wait and see if something better comes along. I work for someone else than you. So we know it's a good enough wage that these guys said, yeah, good deal, we'll take it. And it was early enough in the day that they probably would have had other opportunities. So they agreed for the wage of a penny a day. And so in verse 9, the Bible says, when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. Well, if it's good pay to get paid a penny a day to the hard workers that are there early and that are working through the heat of the day, and if they think that's a good wage, then what kind of a wage must it be for someone who comes along at the 11th hour and makes a penny a day? Could you say the 11th hour guys were overpaid? Anybody could say it, so go ahead. Yes, they were overpaid. We're going to say it together. They were overpaid. Just like some of y'all. Okay. <laughs> Let's say it again. They were overpaid. Uh, okay, and it's truth. They're paid more than they're worth. If the guys in the morning think that a good day's labor is worth a penny, then the guys who came at the last hour and worked for one hour, if they made the same wage, were overpaid. It isn't because they were so special because of their idling ability in the market. Right? All right. Why? Why in the world would the Lord of the vineyard, why would that householder pay that wage? Was it because they were worth it? No. It's because he's just a generous guy. You say, Pastor, now the matter of stewardship comes in here. Yeah, I know, I feel this one. <laughs> These guys don't deserve to get paid that. It's, it's going to teach them bad habits to pay them that. It's not the point. It's not the point of this illustration. The point of this illustration is to show what kind of a man the householder was. He was a good man. And he was a generous man. In verse 10, But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. In verse 11, When they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour. And thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. Now, analyzing the statement they made is what they said truth. What they said was, thou hast made them equal us, the ones who worked in the heat of the day, all day. You made the people who only worked an hour equal to us. Is that true? Sure. It's a true accusation. I want to stop here just for a second and say this. Many of the things you accuse God of are true. Many things God is accused of are true. The problem is what they think that the accusation means. Because this, what God has done here has not been unjust to the guys who came at first. What God has done has been extremely good to the guys which came later. Let me tell a couple of stories. You've heard about my great aunt who got saved at 100 years old last year. That's a great story, isn't it? I just I always marvel uh, that God would save a 100-year-old person. To me, that's just amazing. After a person has refused to bow and come to the cross for the entirety of their life at 100 years old, when they come, God saves them. That's amazing to me. That's incredible. Uh, a couple of years ago, I can't remember quite how many, uh, my, my uh, mom called me and she was talking to my Uncle Don, my grandfather's younger brother. Uncle Don would have been at the time, I think about 90, I think 90 or 92 years old. And he lives out in, uh, I mean he confuses me where he lives. 
I think he lives in, in Portland and in Arizona. Lives in a couple of those places and is always in one or the other. Sometimes he's in Washington. I think he used to live in Washington and Seattle area. Now he lives in Portland. Anyway, he lives out west on the west coast, and so he's a west coast person. If, you, if you've ever met people from out on the west coast, you know that they think the people on the east coast are different, and people on the east coast think they're different. And so that's Uncle Don. Nicest man you ever met. And uh, somewhere in our family heritage, something that really didn't trickle down happened, and that's that there, we used to have some people in our family that were genteel and proper, you could say, and Uncle Don fits that category. In other words, he's a classy guy. My Uncle Don's a very, very classy guy. He's always polite. He's always proper. And uh, it's, it's really uh, actually kind of funny that he's related to us when you think about it. <laughs> My granddad was a lot the same way. He was their mom. And uh, they, something happened from my dad on down that just kind of ended all of that. And anyway, so Uncle Don's a classy, proper guy. He's two years younger than my granddad was. And uh, he is, you know, just really admired and loved his older brother. And my grand, it was always fun to watch Uncle Don come visit every summer. He'd come and stay on the farm. And him and my grandpa would go out and walk five miles around the river or whatever. Just, you know, enjoy being outside. And so Uncle Don is a West Coast outdoorsman, which means that he hikes. You know, in Kansas, we go out and walk. In, in, in the West, you know, they go, you know, they, they backpack and they trail, they walk trails and hike. And so it's always interesting to watch Grandpa, you know, put his shoes on and go and Uncle Don get his stick and his, you know, all the stuff you take when you, you know, you go backpack. And we just walk, you know, we're, oh, let's walk. We're going to walk back if, you know, we're not going to be away somewhere. Anyway, but they're just different. They're very different, my dad and, and my Uncle Don. He was a professor at one of the, one of the, universities out there. We've always prayed my whole life for Uncle Don to be saved. All my whole life we always prayed, our family had, for Uncle Don to be saved. My grandpa's side of the family, they all got saved later on. My grandma got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. My dad got saved a few years before I was born. and He was very, very wicked and uh, just just kind of believed everything that they, they teach you when you're a uh, product of the school system. He believed he was an animal. And he believed that there's no life after death, and he lived like it. And so he got saved. He, he really came to the end of that and really just said, you know, God, Jesus saved me. And God saved my dad, and it really changed the trajectory of our entire family. Uh, my dad uh, took a missionary, and he had been witnessing to, he witnessed to his granddad, and his granddad got saved, and he'd been witnessing to his dad for uh, quite a few years. And my grandpa was out tilling a field, actually. He was out. Uh, actually planting, I think, in, in one of his fields. And my dad took a missionary out, and Grandpa pulled up and stopped on his tractor. He was refueling and probably uh, refilling the, putting grain back in the in the the wheat drill. And, and uh, the missionary, I believe his name was Jim Lyons, said, wouldn't you like to be saved? And my Grandpa said, yeah, I would. He said, you know, and Grandpa knelt down in the field and got saved. Mm -hmm. So he got saved, and my dad's twin sister had gotten saved. My dad's brother got saved. And um, on my dad's side of the family, pretty much all my cousins have been born again, and uh, we're all saved, but Uncle Don wasn't Grandpa's older brother. And I'm telling you, from the time I was a kid, we would pray that Uncle Don would get saved. So a couple of years ago, uh, my mom said, she kept saying, you know, she started writing Uncle Don letters. Every time he'd come out and visit, she'd write him a long three or four page letter. Uncle Don, we love you so much, we want you to be saved, we want you to be born again. And uh, when I was probably my late teens, Uncle Don started going to a Bible study in a non-believing church. There are churches that don't believe the gospel, and he would do that. Uh, and so he's open to Bible study and that sort of thing, but he never could see why he needed to be saved. I think about two or three years ago, uh, it must have been, you know what, I think it would have been the year we moved into this building because I was working out in the parking lot, and I got a phone call uh, from my mom. She said, Ryan! I said, yeah. She said, I have Uncle Don here, and he wants to ask you something. And so Uncle Don got on the phone. He said, well, hello, Ryan. You know, he's real polite and nice. I said, oh, Uncle Don, how you doing? He said, good. He says, your mom won't leave me alone. <laughs> he says, she keeps pestering me, and uh, he, she keeps bothering me. She's keep trying to tell me that I'm not going to heaven. And uh, I said, well, are you going to heaven, Uncle Don? He said, of course I am. And I said, well, why? He said, well, he said, you know, our family, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we were born in the church. You know, we were, I was baptized when I was a kid, you know. And I said, uh, well, what else? He said, well, you know what? He says, I'm a good person. I'm just as good as anyone in the family, isn't it? It's true. He's a good guy. 
I'm just as good as anyone. He's nicer than the rest of us, actually, realistically. Uh, so he's a great guy. Uh, and so he told me about that. And I said, well, Uncle Don, I said, let me show you a man that you could relate to in the Bible. And I took him to John chapter 3, and I explained to him about Nicodemus being a Pharisee and what that meant. Pharisee is a bad word to us, but it actually isn't a bad word. Pharisee means somebody who kept the law, someone who was conscientious about being a good person. And Nicodemus would have been an outstanding Pharisee because he was a ruler of the Jews, and he would have been accepted as very good among his peers, wouldn't he? And so then I showed how that Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so really kind of sunk home with Uncle Don that it doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what your pedigree or your background is, you have to be born again. And so he said, well, I'll think that over. And uh, he hung up. About 15 minutes later, he called. He said, okay, I got born again. And uh, so I, I want to say he would have been about 90 or 92, somewhere in there, and Uncle Don got saved. Now here's the deal. At least since the late 1970s, our family has been witnessing to Uncle Don. And so if he got saved, say he, they started witnessing to him somewhere around 1975, 1976, sometime in that era, then if he got saved in 2015 or thereabouts, how long had he been witness to? Now, yeah, more than 40 years. Literally, the gospel had been shared with him for more than 40 years, and he just never saw his need for salvation. If it were me that were to judge, I'd say that he's an 11th hour guy. I don't know how, how long Uncle Don's going to live. I want to say that he is now uh, 94, thereabouts. I think he's about 94, 95 years. I'm going to guess that 30 years from now, Uncle Don will be in heaven. I don't think he'll be here anymore. And I would say probably when a guy gets to be about 100 or so, he gets sick and tired of living normally, and that's about it for most people. I don't know about Uncle Don. He'll probably still like to golf at that time, but he does a lot right now. He, he golfs every day. Uh, but anyway, the, the question is, is it fair that he heard the gospel 40 years before and that God saved him just a couple of years ago. Is it fair that he gets to go to the same heaven everybody else gets to go to? Yeah. Now you're conditioned to answer and to say yes it is, but actually we don't think that way, do we? I mean, when should he, when ought he to have gotten saved? First time he heard. First time he heard. Now, I will say the first time he heard, he didn't hear I mean, it was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you think that I need to, you know, you religious quacks, you know, I've been a better person than you have your whole life, and now you're telling me I need to do whatever. I don't know what you guys are saying. This is nuts. You know? Honestly, Uncle Don's experience of our side of the family would have been that, uh, you know, I, Calvin, you raised some crazy kids. Uh, Calvin's my uncle. Uh, John Price is my dad. And my dad was wild and crazy. My dad is 67, no, 68. Yeah, 68 years old. And if I go into the small town where he was raised, anybody that knew him when they were a teenager can still tell me stories I've never heard. Like, literally. My dad burned his school down. How many of y'all ever did that? You know, uh, I, I, I was working when I was in college with a couple guys in the mechanic shop. And one guy's like, oh, yeah, I was in junior high when your dad was in senior high. He was a legend. You know, he started telling me stories. You know, my, I'm telling you, before my dad got saved. And so Uncle Don's mindset was, yeah, of course you need to be saved, John. Of course you did. It was obvious you needed God. You know, the people that get out and work actually normally are the kind of people that realize I need to make some money. I need to pay some bills. I've got some things I need to do. And actually, if you look at our context, when, when the householder went into the market later in the day, there are guys standing in the marketplace. They're just standing around. And they didn't say, hey, you still looking for someone? He went to them and said, why are you standing here idle? In other words, he sought them out. And he offered to them work. 
And he said, go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever I want to pay you. And they went into the vineyard and they worked for one hour and he sent out the guy that paid, he sent out his guy that paid them and he paid them a penny. And the guys that had worked all day got paid a penny and the pay was the same. Because it isn't about the job, it isn't about the task. It's an illustration about the Lord. And there's just something that is more than just and more than equal about our God. Do you hear me? In other words, the notion that the individuals who agreed to labor all day for a penny, the notion that they had something to murmur about when they agreed that that was what they'd work for, is actually not reflecting well on them, even when they're murmuring against the Lord. So they agreed to work for that, and that was actually a good deal, wasn't it? In verse 13, he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto, even, I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Now, is this an actual story? Is this something that actually... Uh, actually happened. Uh, no, I don't think it actually is. He says it's like unto a householder that did this. So Jesus, when it's something real that happens, like the rich man and Lazarus, gives names, uh, gives detail, and those details aren't given here. And so Jesus is illustrating something. You see, sometimes I think you and I think that God oughtn't to save some people. In other words, Sometimes we think that some individuals with regard to the gospel or even the time that they come about receiving the gospel, sometimes we think that it either ought to be too late or they ought to be somehow beyond redemption. And we forget, actually, about a couple of common sense things. First of all, a good wage is a good wage. Now, we're talking about wages. What does the Bible say about our wages? We all know Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. What do we deserve because of what we are, because of what we've done to God? We deserve judgment. And God told man before he ever sinned that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. God told Adam, He said, If you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat thereof, you're dead. You'll die. And Adam ate of that tree, and instantly his eyes were open to know good and evil. And he was spiritually dead. And all of a sudden, he began to live in a corrupt world where there was physical death. So there was spiritual death, and there was spiritual, and there was spiritual death. And which death did Adam deserve, spiritual or physical? Both. He deserved both, didn't he? God told him, this is what will happen. He did it, and it happened, and he deserved it. And my friend, God is a just God. And when you sin, you've made your decision to sin against God. There's never been a person who's been born without conscience. Now, the only person who's ever been born without sin is Jesus Christ. But every one of us, before we ever sin, know it. I think of, I haven't told this story in a while, but I think of when I was about uh, three years old, two and a half, three years old, and I, my brother and I could both remember back when we were really young. But I remember we grew up in a house where kids don't open the refrigerator. We just didn't do that. You don't open the refrigerator. You don't get in the fridge and see if there's something to eat. When we were growing up, that wasn't the way it was in our house. The food uh, was eaten at meals, and food was given to you. It wasn't taken. And I remember... Uh, in a little house in Headville, Kansas, uh, that one time we had uh, some fresh strawberries in the refrigerator, and I liked strawberries when I was two or three years old, pretty well, I still do. And I remember also something we didn't normally have was that we had some powdered sugar donuts, you know, the little, the, I don't know if they're a Hostess brand or whatever, but the little sugar, powdered sugar donuts, and I liked those as well. And I remember it was getting to be evening it was still light outside but i remember uh going to my mom and saying i think i'm going to go to bed in our house we didn't decide we were going to bed we were put to bed especially at two or three years old 
But I told her, no, I think I'm going to go to bed. And she said, well, it's not even dark out yet. You don't have to go to bed yet. I said, I think I'm, gonna, I think I'm tired. I think I'm going to go to bed. And my mom, being the suspicious individual as she was, uh, said, okay. And she let me go to bed, but then she checked up on me. And uh, underneath our bed upstairs, I had a wet washcloth. I'd taken a washcloth and had the foresight to wet it and slip it underneath the bed. And then I had also stashed right next to the wet washcloth the package of strawberries and the package of powdered donuts. So I decided I was going to go to bed and had enough foresight. Uh, I just think of this. I've, I've always thought of myself as clever, and this is more of the evidence of it, okay? So I always, <laughs> I not only planned on stealing powdered donuts, but I planned on covering it up, you know, because I had a wet washcloth to wash the powder off of me when Mom came in and checked up on me, but uh, I got busted anyhow, so I mean, maybe I'm not as clever as I thought I was. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, I was about three years old and I had, I had enough knowledge of what I was doing to know that it was theft, that I'd taken something that didn't belong to me, and I had enough knowledge to know that I was a liar, and uh, I knew what I was doing was evil and it was wrong, and I was covering it up. Because I was a deliberate, on-purpose sinner. And you know I was born that way, so have all of us been. We know what we do is wrong. We know what we do is sin. We can play our silly games of self-justification. And that's precisely what these individuals here are actually doing. They're saying, hey, we deserve a penny. They don't deserve a penny because of how long we work. And the reality of it is in the actual scenario that Jesus is giving, we're talking about eternal life. We're talking about being part of God's kingdom. And the reality of it is that people that came to work early don't deserve a penny. They deserve hell. And people that came to work at the 11th hour, they don't even deserve the opportunity, to be quite honest, because they didn't seek out work. They were sought out by the Master. The good men of the house. And it's fascinating to us that somehow we seem to think that there's a difference between people in the first hour and people in the last hour. But really the difference between people who go to heaven and people who don't is not whether or not they're deserving. It's what they do with Jesus. Or what God's willing to do for them. Jesus is right at this time getting ready to go up to Jerusalem for the express purpose of dying on the cross. It's interesting in all the gospel events, the timeliness of this being the last story that Jesus tells before he tells them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die for sin. It's interesting this is the last story he tells them, isn't it? You ever think about that? Why would the Holy Spirit have Matthew to include this story at this time? Did you ever ask that question? It's not... It's not what we like to say, brain, brain, uh, sur brain science or rocket surgery. It's not one of those. It's not, it doesn't take a brilliant person to actually understand it. But it takes a person with a little bit of humility to understand what Jesus said when he said, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I'm good? So they literally are murmuring against the good men of the house because he's good. They're upset with God because he's good. Now listen to me, Christian. I don't know how many times in my life I've heard people complain about God because He's good. I've, I don't know how many times I've heard people accuse God's goodness of being evil. You ever heard someone say, if God's good, then why would He? Why would He send anyone into hell? Why would He judge sinners? Do you realize how wrong a question that is or how absolutely illogical that actually is? The reason God judges sinners is because He's good. <laughs> the, the very question has the answer embedded in it, doesn't it? These guys are saying, God's not good because He gave too much to these people. He's not good because He's too good. That's the argument, right? God isn't good because He's too good. And the same argument is made about God's goodness. God isn't good. If He were good, why isn't He good? In other words, if God were good, why would He judge the wicked? My friend, the reason God judges the wicked is because He's good. 
good, and they're wicked. Or the opposite end of the question that the same person asked. If God is good, then why does He allow evil? If God's good, then why does He allow evil? Because He's good. It's incredible, isn't it? The entire baseless lack of logic behind the accusations that people make against God. If God's good, then He'll save sinners. And if God's good, He'll judge the wicked. Isn't it true? Both of those things are true, aren't they? If God's good, He'll be merciful to sinners. And if God is good, He'll judge the wicked. And how can anyone have a problem with either of those things? And yet I've heard Christians, they have to come up with elaborate messages to explain why God would save some people and why God wouldn't save others. And sometimes they use the first and last argument. Well, you know, these people deserve to be saved because they're good. That's the argument. If, God's, if they're saying God's bad, they're making themselves judges of God, and they're claiming to be good, and God isn't good. They're good because they showed up early. <laughs> and these guys are bad because they showed up late, but the reality of it is, is that the wage was so good, none of them deserved it, early or late. What everybody deserves in context is hell. And I thank God. I mean, God saved me when I was a child. And I thank God for that. It's been a wonderful thing, actually, to have a life of living for Jesus and knowing God. Been able to live confidently in God's will and have, uh, have God's, uh, just have God guide and lead me and use my life. It's been a wonderful thing. You know, it's also a wonderful thing to see my Uncle Don get saved in his 90s. And my great Aunt Margie get saved at 100 years old. Because all of those reflect not on, well, you know what, they, they should have gotten saved when they were kids. They didn't. You know why they got saved? Because God's merciful. And because God's good. They didn't get saved because all of a sudden there was a spark of redemption when they turned 90 or 100. I didn't get saved because there was something innately wonderful about me when I was a child. I got saved because I needed to. And God offered me salvation, eternal life, and I've gotten to labor in the Lord's vineyard, if you will, for most of my life. I think it's a wonderful thing that I've been able to be saved longer than I've been lost. I have been saved, uh, I think this June or July, it will have been um, 36 years I'll have been saved. That's great, isn't it? I've been saved a lot longer than I've been lost, than I was lost. That's a wonderful thing. And you know what? This year I've seen people that are my age, some people that are older than me, that have gotten saved. And guess what they got for trusting Jesus as their Savior? They got the same heaven that I'm promised. The very same one. Is that fair? Yes. No. <laughs> trying to trick you. Is that fair? No, because they deserved hell. And so do I. Actually. But what does it reflect on? It reflects on the truth that God's good. <laughs> and my friend, that's universal. If you came in the first hour and got a penny, that's good. If you came in the eleventh hour and got a penny, that's good. Which is better? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's heaven. When we're talking about eternal life, we're talking about heaven. Ought you to have lived for Jesus in your youth? Yes. Wouldn't it be nice to have some things that you've done for the Master? Yes! But is it a different heaven that you go to if you get saved later than sinner? And the answer is no. Why is that? Because that's just how good God is. And Jesus concludes by simply saying in verse 16, So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. <laughs> and it's so ironic. I won't go there today. It's not worth the time. But it's so ironic that the last phrase of our text today, people try to make it seem as though God selects individuals for heaven and selects individuals for hell. Which is absolutely ridiculous. 
in context, if you think about it, isn't it? When God's taken people from the beginning and from the middle and from the end and given them the same thing, many are called, a few are chosen, is simply, simply a statement of how many people receive God's goodness. And that does bring us to our invitation here today. My friend, the reality of it is, is that there is a such thing as eternal life. You know that you have an eternal soul that will live somewhere forever, heaven or hell. It's true, isn't it? You know it in your heart. But it's also just every bit as much truth is that what you do with Jesus, whether it's where you're at or where you've been, has everything to do with your eternal destination. In other words, God's called everyone. The Bible very, very expressly, explicitly states that Jesus Christ died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Many years I've reflected on the reality that Jesus died for everyone, but everyone isn't going to heaven. Matter of fact, most of the times when we look at individuals who come to the truth, we see a contrast being drawn that the path to destruction is broad, and there are many people that are going down that route. But the way to eternal life is the narrow way, and there's few that find it. So many times we think that if the majority thinks this way or the majority is going this way, then it must be true. My friend, it isn't so at all. If you're going to Jesus, my friend, you're, you're, it's the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And my friend, whether you come to Jesus early, whether you come to Jesus in the middle, or whether you come to Jesus late, He's the truth, He's the way, and He's the only way. Don't be one of the many. Be one of the few. Many are called. Few are chosen. How do I get to be chosen? Well, my friend, God's already called you. You do the choosing. You make the choice. Come into the Lord's vineyard. You're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You've vacillated on it. Or you've, uh, you've, you've kicked it over in your mind. You thought, well, this is, I don't know about these things about God. or I don't know. My friend, you know what you need to do? You need to just come to the realization that God's good. You know, many people go to hell because in their minds, for some reason, they have this accusation or this belief that God isn't good. They have a problem with a good God judging. That's nuts. They have a good problem with a good God being merciful. And that's just as crazy. Isn't it? You know what all of us need? We need a Savior. My friend, Jesus is universally offered as a Savior. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do you think about God? What are your thoughts on the Gospel? We have so many wise, quote, thoughts and sayings that expressly contradict what the Scripture very, very clearly teaches. And before Jesus ever went to Jerusalem to die on the cross, He wanted to let people know, hey, if you're an early comer, if you're a late comer, it's the same destination. Back to that thought of the, de of the late comer, early comer. You ever think what it must have been like on the day of Pentecost? Where the 120 believers are huddled in an upper room praying, and waiting for the promise of the Father. And then the power of the Spirit comes down. And Peter and the rest of the apostles go out into the city and they begin to preach the gospel in fullness of power. And the very people who danced around the cross crying, crucify Him. The Bible says we're pricked to their hearts and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And I don't know about you, but... If I think the way man thinks, I think, well, you know what? It's too late for you. You should have thought about this before you put him on the cross. Ever think about that? But what did they say? Repent. Change your mind about Jesus. Be baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost. Peter said, For the promise is unto you and unto your children and to them that are far off. I think it should have been too late. By the time they had rebelled against Jesus and crucified Him on the cross, I think they should have set their decision and that should have been it. But the difference between me and God, hear me now, is that God's good. And the very individuals who cried crucify Him and rejected Him for their Savior became believers, became filled with the Holy Ghost, and were added to the church. And the church 
is an eclectic, a very similar word to the word chosen, an eclectic group of individuals who came at all different times, all of them undeserving, but realizing that in spite of what we deserve, God is good. Father, I pray that you would help us to recognize this universal truth and respond accordingly. We ask for Jesus' sake. Before we finish our prayer this morning, I want to ask that everyone keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment because we're going to have a time of invitation. It's so important in every time that we meet in a service and the gospel is mentioned or preached, it's so important to give people an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And so if you're here this morning and you've never received God's goodness, you've never actually called on the name of the Lord to be saved, you've never said, God, uh, I want to be your child I want to receive the gift of eternal life. If you've never done that, and you're here this morning, could I say to you that today's the day? I don't know whether it's the first hour, or the third hour, or the eleventh hour for you. God knows it, but I know this, you may not have another day. Only God knows how many days you have, and that is His determined plan. And my friend, the decision for you today is to go into the Lord's vineyard or in the, in the actual context to receive Jesus as your Savior. If that's you and you're here this morning, and God spoke in your heart and said, you know what, today's the day of salvation. Would you just slip your hand up? Just slip your hand up so I can see it. I won't call you out or embarrass you. wouldn't do anything like that. But uh, today, today's the day for me that I need to do business about this matter of eternal life. I need to receive the free gift. Okay, I have a second question, and that would be for those that have trusted Jesus as their Savior. Here this, this morning, and you'd say, Pastor Price, you know, sometimes I find more in common with the guy who's on the wrong side of the argument. And today I can hear I can hear my own words and my own thoughts sometimes accusing God of not being good. And actually actually I'm the one that's not good. God's always good. God's good to judge and God's good to be merciful. And I've realized that truth today and God's dealing with me in my heart about it. And there's some thinking that I need God's help to get sorted out and straightened out about the gospel and about God's goodness. Pastor, God spoke with me about it. I'm going to do business with him. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up. God spoke with me about it. I'm going to do business. Yep, slip them right back down. Slip them up, slip them right back down. Okay? God, I just ask that you would please bless and move in the invitation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask, really quickly, I want to explain the invitation, and then I just want to I ask everybody to take your blue hymn books and turn to page 241. While you're doing that, the invitation is a time in our church when we would invite you to respond. In other words, if God spoke to you today and He showed you truth, it's actually a privilege, isn't it? To have God's Word and God show you something from His Word. Do you think God just talks to us so that we can hear His voice? Or does God talk to us so that we can hear what He says and respond to it? Well, I think the latter would be more true than the first, wouldn't you? And so that's why we have an invitation sometimes in our church is to give you the opportunity to respond to what God said. If you raised your hand and said, you know what, God spoke to me today. Well then, before you begin singing in the invitation today, maybe just go ahead and personalize, deal with God about whatever that matter was. You're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior. Uh, my friend, you could, you could settle that right now. And uh, you, could, you could just go to God and just accept the free gift of eternal life if you need some help, some further explanation about the gospel. Brother Taj is standing in the back of the room, and that's what he's there for with the Bible, so he can show you how to know for sure you have eternal life. But what would be a real tragedy today would be to have God speak to you and then to leave this place not having responded. So let's begin our invitation now at this time. If you're physically able to do so, will you stand your feet? Open your blue hymn books up to page 241. We're going to sing the song, Had You Any Room for Jesus? If the answer in your heart is yes, then sing it. If the answer in your heart is I need to do business with God, then uh, do business with Him as He's led and as He's spoken to you.